Would you stand and sing? In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, yes, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we gather together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow. way to begin our morning together and it's only going to get better from here so i invite you to have a seat and let's turn our attention up to the baptistry this morning good morning we have eight students who are getting baptized <laughs> this is ansley dykes ansley have you accepted jesus as your lord and savior yes then upon your profession of faith and in obedience to the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Coquise Jackson. 
Aquis, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Then upon your profession of faith and in obedience to the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. of faith and in obedience to the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Leah Jacob, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. And upon your profession of faith and in obedience to the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Mrs. Sydney Belomo. Sydney, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. And upon your profession of faith and in obedience to the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Dustin Kozlowski. Dustin, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Then upon your profession of faith and in obedience to the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Jackson Dykes. Jackson. Have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Then upon your profession of faith and in obedience to the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Son and the Holy Spirit. All right, we've got one more. I had a, I had a parent come to me last week and say, you know what, my, my son is getting baptized, and I think it's time for me to also come and publicly say that I've, I've decided to follow Jesus and that I want to publicly just say, hey, I'm, I'm here and I'm ready to make this step. So, Mr. Steve Whitson, if you will come. Then upon your profession of faith and in obedience to the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you guys. Uh, remember the impact that you guys have on the student ministry and how you have a part in changing these lives and then continuing to disciple them. Enjoy the rest of your service and just praise God continually. Yeah, somebody ought to be on their feet right now. Amen. That's right. That's right. Well, I'll tell you what, you can remain standing as long as you can uh, uh, listen to me for a couple of things. I want to give you some really, really important information this morning before we move forward in our service. We want to talk about uh, Easter weekend, an Easter weekend to remember that's coming up in just a few weeks. And uh, i got to give you some, some really important stuff. Number one, Good Friday at the Grand. How many of you already know about Good Friday at the Grand? Raise your hand. Good. We've been talking about that. Good. There's two services, one at 4 and one at 7. Okay. We want you to come. Okay. That's number one. We want all of you to come. 
All right, you, you get that. All of you, we want you to be there. All right, change your spring break plans, whatever you have to do, but be there. All right, number two, we want you to tell everybody you know about it and bring a whole bunch of people with you. You did such an amazing job at Christmas bringing over 2,300 people here um, that we could count. And uh, we want you to do the same thing again. Talk it up, get it on billboards. Listen, you have to have a ticket, okay? We did tickets at Christmas, but they're free. You have to have a ticket. They're available at both desks as you leave today. So pick up your tickets, take a few to, to give to people that you're inviting, and let's use that as a tool to fill up the grand at 4 o'clock and 7 o'clock on Good Friday. All right? Good. Yeah. Our choir, listen, our choir's been working for, for months on this stuff, and our, and our good friend Charles Billingsley is going to be with us. It's going to be unbelievable. We're going to experience the Lord's Supper together, a message from Pastor Lee. It's going to be a really, really incredible, uh, outstanding experience over there. Then the very next day on Saturday is the Great Egg Dash. We've got a helicopter coming, and we're going to drop 25,000 eggs and, and have all kinds of kids everywhere. Does that sound like fun to you? <laughs> yeah. So listen. We need help. We need about 100 volunteers for the Great Egg Dash, and you can sign up for that at the table in the lobby right after worship this morning. And so please step up for that. Then on Sunday, Easter Sunday, 930 and 1045, right in here, two services, 930, 1045. We're swinging for the fence. It's going to be an unbelievable day together, an Easter weekend to remember. Have you got all that? Yes. Let me ask you one more time. That wasn't very convincing at all. Have you got all that? Yeah. Good. Fantastic. Way to go. Hey, listen, if you're visiting with us today, what a wonderful day to experience all that God is doing here at Mabel White as these, as these students have come through the baptism uh, today. Uh, and we'd love to uh, be able to follow up with you. If you would take that yellow card in the back of the pew and just fill that out. And then bring it to the welcome desk right out here after the service. We've got a really nice gift we'd like to give you and your family. And we'd love to meet you and get acquainted. But right now, everybody, let's turn around, shake hands with each other. Be sure everyone feels welcome this morning as we worship together. Amen.
given you some new songs in the last couple of weeks, all preparing for our time at the Grand on Good Friday. This is one of them. You'll catch on. But let these words get into your heart. On the cross was a gift freely given, righteousness for the weak, sent from heaven with your strength by your grace. We stand forgiven, we lift high Jesus Christ, the name of freedom.
than I am right now, that I have been for these things that are coming up. We, have, we had eight students and a parent come get baptized this morning, and that's incredible. And, and we've got this food on the stage. We've taken up coats. We've taken up blankets so that we could participate. This love, loud emphasis we're doing dur during the month of March, and that's coming to a head next weekend. We have 13 projects going on all over the city that we're reaching out to our community. Not to say, look how good we are, not to pat ourselves on the back but to say that it's important to us that we reach out to people in this city and that we share the gospel with them, that we share the love of God and that we share the truth of the Bible with them. And so that's what we're doing. When we come and bring cans, when we brought coats, and then next week as we go and serve, it's not about us feeling good about ourselves. It's, us, it's about us lifting up God and saying, God, we think you are the most important things in our life and we wanna share you with everyone around us. And so this morning, as you give, that's just another way that you partner with us. We, the student ministry, having eight people come, the, the cans that we give, the, the, the things that we do next week as we serve, as we give our time, and as you give your money, that's your way of partnering and saying, God, we're, we're all in, we're all about reaching our community, we're all about sharing your gospel. So let's pray this morning as we take up our offering. God, I thank you for who you are. God, I thank you for your son, Jesus, that he died on the cross. God, and I thank you for the way that you're working in this church, God, that you're moving our hearts towards our community, God, toward reaching out to our city, towards, <coughs> towards sharing your message of hope with people who may not otherwise have any hope. God, and I pray for the offering this morning, God, that you would bless it, that your hand would be upon it, God, and that you would use it to do mighty works in your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.
Well, the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about a blueprint for marriage, and um, today I want to continue along those lines of thinking. Uh, in 1989, I was in Las Vegas, and um, the week I was out there, there was a huge fight that was taking place. Sugar Ray Leonard was fighting Roberto Duran, and uh, the thing that really struck me about that whole week is, I mean, it seemed like everywhere we went, there were celebrities I mean, all over the place. We were eating lunch one day, and uh, I mean, at the table right next to me, I could almost reach out and touch the table. Marvin Hagler and his wife came and sat down at that table right next to us. Another evening, we were at dinner, and about four tables over, I looked, and Barry Manilow was sitting there uh, eating dinner. Uh, I saw Muhammad Ali. I saw Bo Derek. I mean, everywhere we went, uh, there seemed to be celebrities. Well, I didn't have tickets to the fight. So uh, I was forced to watch it on television. Uh, and as the fight was getting ready to begin, uh, the referee brings uh, the two fighters to the center of the ring, and uh, he gives them the instructions for the fight. He says something like this. He says, okay. He said, I want a clean fight. No low blows, no headbutts, or excessive clinching. After he said that, he kind of paused for just a moment, looked at both players, and he said, all right, are we ready? He said, let's get it on. And the crowd went nuts. The two fighters went to their respective corners. The bell be rang, and that's when the fight began. You know, I don't know if you thought about it before, but marital conflict sometimes is like boxing. Uh, husbands and wives step into the ring and they go toe to toe. They throw verbal punches. They display fancy footwork. Incredible negotiating skills are displayed. But the cold hard facts are this. Fights, arguments, 
disagreements, spats, <laughs> let's call them brujas, whatever, are a part of marriage relationships a lot of times. And there are those times when the lines are drawn in the sand and sides are taken and with tear-filled eyes of hurt and anger, unresolved conflict will result a lot of times in both of you hugging your respective sides of the king-size mattress that all of a sudden seems far too small. Let me ask you a question. Do you think for a moment that a, pers that a professional boxer would step into the ring with millions of dollars on the line, with the possibility of winning a world championship, do you think that they would step into the ring and enter into that conflict, that fight, without training, without being toned, and without the general rules of boxing? Well, the sad irony is that there are countless husbands and wives who get married and they deal with conflict in their relationships without any kind of training, without any kind of knowledge of the general rules that should govern conflict resolution. And, and hopefully what I want to do today is, is change that. Uh, today what I want to do is I want to share with you uh, some ground rules for conflict resolution. Now, let me say this. What I'm going to talk to you about today really holds true in every relationship. I mean, you can apply it to your marriage, you can apply it to your relationship uh, with your family members, with your colleagues, with your friends. I mean, there's no limit on that, but since 94% of us are going to get married at least once in our lifetime, we better pay attention to these rules even if we're not married. Now, as I go through these, these, these steps, these rules today for conflict resolution, I, I don't want you to think for a second that, that I've got the corner on the market on this, uh, because I don't. I mean, Gene and I have been married 31 years, and I'm not going to stand up here and not tell you the truth. At times, there is conflict. At times, we do have arguments. We have disagreements. Um, we do. But we work hard at resolving the conflict in a constructive way. And, and before I dive in, I want you to think about something. And this is directed toward those of us that are married. I want you to think about the last disagreement you had. Think about the last fight you had, argument, whatever you want to call it. I want you to think about the last time there was conflict in, in the relationship that you have with your husband and wife. It may have been a while. You may have had it this morning on your way to church. <laughs> what tactics did you use? How loudly did you speak? What issues did you bat back and forth? Were there any low blows? headbutts, or excessive clenching. Well, I want you to consider how you might have reacted by using the following rules. Number one is this. Ground rule number one, count the cost before you begin. It's so tempting for us to launch what I'm going to call verbal missiles. Um, we love verbal missiles, don't we? You know what I'm talking about, the zingers, uh, those verbal punches that we throw. And the thing I want you to understand is that marriage is really a time where we collect intimate data. Think about it now. Your spouse shares with you their feelings, their thoughts, their struggles. And, and, and over time, we download those things into our spirit. And, and here's what happens. A lot of times we have an argument, we have a conflict, and tempers begin to flare. And we begin to perceive that we are losing the conflict. We are losing the argument. We are losing the disagreement. We're coming out on the short end of this thing, and all of a sudden, we press the button and we launch one of those verbal missiles. And a lot of times, it manifests itself in name-calling. Think about it now. We compare our spouse to the dog, the cat, to other people. I mean, we just intend to hurt 
during that time. We label, we compare. I mean, can you believe it? I mean, we take sensitive information that we've downloaded from them during our intimate times of sharing, and we take that sensitive information and we use it as a weapon to inflict hurt. And the thing I want you to understand is a well-armed verbal missile can hinder future growth and even destroy a lot of previous gains in a marriage. And as satisfying as it may feel at the time, I mean, the tough reality is, is that these verbal missiles, they never serve a good purpose. Nothing constructive ever comes out of them. A recent study on marital conflict that I was reading said that one of these verbal missiles can tear apart, can take away 20 acts of kindness. It's the 1 to 20 ratio, and that's a scary ratio. That one slip of the tongue cancels out 20 things that I've done right. So, count the cost before you begin. Second rule is this, respond, don't react. You ever notice that these verbal missiles are, they're usually fairly loud and intrusive. Listen to what God tells us in Proverbs 15.1. It says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And so as we are living life intimately, as we're sharing our heart, even in conflict, it's important that we do something, that we wave the banner of good manners. And why is it that we're often nicer to those that we're not married to, that we're not in intimate relationships with, than we are our spouse? I'll never forget one day Gene and I were in the midst of a passionate discussion. We're having a fight. And I mean, we're in the throes of it, and all of a sudden my cell phone rings. What did we ever do without cell phones? It rings. And so I reach in my pocket, I pull it out, and I, and I see who it is. And I told her, I said, hang on, I got to take this. And so I said, hello. All of a sudden, everything changed. My attitude changed, my demeanor changed, my voice inflection changed, uh, everything about me changed. And so I had about a two-minute conversation with this individual, very nice, very congenial. I hung up the phone and went right back to the fight. <laughs> you laugh because you've been there. You've been in the midst of one of those discussions. You've been in the midst uh, of conflicts and the telephone rings or somebody rings the doorbell. Uh, you know, I had no problem extending courteous and, and mannered speech to the person on the phone, but in reality, I should have made a greater effort to extend the same and more to her. The Bible is clear in Genesis 20, I mean 2, 24, that when a husband and a wife unite with one another in marriage, they become one flesh. And then uh, in 1 Peter 3, 8, we find these words, all of you be of one mind. You see, as, as a Christ follower, as a husband and wife, we're not only one in marriage, but we are one in Christ. And God tells us in no uncertain terms that some serious oneness ought to take place within a Christian marriage. Not only are we one flesh in our relationship, but we are in one relationship. We're a part of the body of Christ. We are one with Christ. And so we cannot say, well, it's his problem. It's her problem. No, it's not his problem. It's not her, your problem because if you read Scripture, if I'm one flesh and I'm one in Christ, I don't have a problem. We have a problem. Peter continues, having compassion for one another, be tenderhearted, be courteous. That word courteous means, uh, it's the same word we get our word court from. And, and so when you're courteous towards your spouse, when you're mannerly towards your spouse, you are courting them. What do you do, for example, when your spouse does something around the house for you? Ladies, maybe you come home and he had dinner cooked. He doesn't normally cook dinner, but you come home and, and he has dinner cooked. I mean, how do you respond? 
Guys, you come in and your wife has ironed all of the clothes that, that needed ironing. How do you respond to that? Ladies, do you say, hey, it's pretty good, but you know, if you'd have used a little bit more salt and you'd have done this, done that, it'd been a whole lot better. <laughs> or if she irons your clothes, you say, well, you know, I, I appreciate you ironing my clothes, but you never iron my pants this way. I always like my pants ironed that way. How do you respond when they do something for you? It ought to be a word of appreciation. And so are you waving the banner of good manners? Are you being polite? You see, because here's the truth. Your spouse matters to God, and when you treat them with kindness and respect, you are showing that they matter to you. Rule number three, stay on subject. <laughs> stay on subject. You know what that means? That means don't chase rabbits. Don't use it as an opportunity to talk about the 15 other things that you're upset about. Stay on subject. Stick with the issue. If the issue is finances, have a solution-driven discussion about finances. If it's children, have a solution-driven discussion, argument, Whatever you want to say, but, but the goal is to come up with a solution to the issue that's causing conflict. You see, in the heat of the moment, be careful not to drudge up every grudge, every problem you've ever had with your spouse. Stay in the present tense. Uh, Proverbs 8, 12 says uh, that God will respect Israel, will remember their sins no more. And when we bring up the past, we're doing something that God really doesn't do. God, the devil is the master of dredging up the past. But God's forgiveness frees us from the past to focus on the future. You see, Paul, who at one point called himself the chief among sinners, tells us in Philippians 3.13... I may have been the chief of sinners, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to the things which are ahead. And so God doesn't want us to focus on our failures or those of anyone else, especially our spouse. And so love and forgiveness provide hope for the future, not fear of condemnation from the past. But just be on guard. Because whenever there's conflict... Whenever there's a disagreement, the enemy, the devil, will whisper in your ear, don't let him forget about that mistake that he made. Don't let her forget that she has an issue. Forget what lies behind and reach forward to what lies ahead. Number four, don't sweep it under the carpet. Don't sweep conflict under the carpet. You know, uh, too many of us are, let's just say we're subterranean fighters. And, and issues of all sizes and important arise from time to time. But a lot of us, we bury them. Instead of dealing with them when they first surface, we go underground, we go subterranean, and maybe it's what you saw modeled in your family when you were growing up. Maybe your mom and dad just didn't talk about anything that was uncomfortable. You ever known a family like that? They don't have uncomfortable conversations. Everything's great, everything's smooth, everything's fine, everything's wonderful, when in reality there is more stuff buried beneath the surface that they've never dealt with. So deal with it. Deal with it rapidly. Deal with issues when you're rested. Deal with them when you can talk about them. And deal with them, as the Bible says, before the sun goes down on your anger. Ephesians 4.26. Again, this is something we're working on. I, I'm not going to sit here and say that we've never gone to bed at night when we haven't been happy with each other. We have. 
I had a couple tell me that one time. said, you know, we've never gone to bed angry with one another. But we did stay up for 72 straight hours. <laughs> Deal with it. Don't sweep it under the carpet. We're not there yet, but we work hard to get the issues resolved. Number five, don't diagnose your spouse's problem and fail to admit your own issues. <laughs> I mean, Dan could probably write a book. I could write a book. I'm, I'm talking about people that have come to me over the years, and they are self-appointed experts. I mean, they've watched Dr. Phil. They've listened to Dr. Laura. And, I mean, they are the masters of diagnosing their spouse's issues in life. And we feel like we're qualified to psychoanalyze one another. And if we're not real careful whenever conflict arises, we look at our spouse and say, you know what, you drive me nuts because you are so obsessive compulsive. I laugh at Glenn. You know, there was, there was one time when, when Glenn had said, you know, well, we're going to have our child, we're going to have a baby, we're not going to adopt a baby because when you adopt a baby, you don't know what you're getting. I told Glenn, what you don't know is when you have a baby, you don't know what you're getting. <laughs> and we got us one of those there obsessive compulsive ones. You know what I'm talking about. You go to put his socks on him. You're trying to get him ready to go to Sunday school, and the line on the socks where they sewed it together on the end is touching his toes, and he's having an out-of-body experience. Take it off, take it off, take it off, take it off, take it off. <laughs> and after about the fourth time, you want to just lay hands on him in the name of Jesus and just... <laughs> Or you go into his bedroom and you pull open the drawer and his clothes are folded up in Ziploc bags, compartmentalized. I mean, his clothes had to be a certain way. We had to cut the tags out of the back of his shirt because if a tag was on him, he's, oh! <laughs> he's still that way? God bless whoever marries him. We get into conflict with our spouse, and we look at him and say, you know what, you're driving me nuts. You are so obsessive, compulsive. Or we look and say, you know what, you are such an enabler for our kids. This is just classic textbook stuff. Let me give you some advice. Don't even go there. Matthew chapter 7, verse 3 is a verse we rarely apply to marriage because if we're honest, it's convicting. Listen to what Jesus said. Why do you look at that speck in your brother's eye and you don't notice the log that's in your own eye? Now, obviously, Jesus is using hyperbole here, a little Hebrew humor. Uh, but just picture this. Here's a husband walking around, and he's got a saw log hanging out of his eye, but he's pointing out the speck on his wife's contact lens. And this is what I want you to understand. When I am critical of my spouse or they are critical of me, we are in fact criticizing ourselves because we are one now. And so when I'm critical of Gina or she's critical of me, we are in fact criticizing ourselves because we are one. We are on the same page. It's not a relationship of dissonance. It's a relationship of harmony. And, you know, you could even take this and you could even go a step further because it's been said that the Christian church, the Christian army is the only army that shoots its own wounded. Do you realize that when you're critical of a brother or sister in Christ that you are in fact being critical of yourself because the Bible says that we are one in Christ? You see, in our egotistic, me-centered world, we have a tough time with the concept of harmony and oneness. But the competitive man, one man upmanship is so pervasive in our culture that it cannot and should not find its way into a marital scheme. And so here's the question. Do you measure your words that you speak into your spouse's life? 
Does it ever cross your mind, what does she need? What does he need? And we speak according to the need. Or are you just spouting off selective psycho Bible to meet your own perceived need to feel better and to make them feel worse? Skip the psycho Bible. And, and, and focus and concentrate on those critical words or phrases or conversations that will build you both up as one flesh. Ground rule number six. Listen before you speak. You know, a lot of us get ready to pounce instead of listening to what the spouse is saying. We're doing this major league wind-up during the conflict. And we just can't wait to throw the fastball right at the head of our spouse while they're still talking. You see, because when we're set to pounce to interrupt, it's a sign that we're not listening. When we listen, when you listen, you are listing things mentally. But what happens a lot of times is there's conflict. There's a discussion, there's an argument that's going on. And all of a sudden, your spouse says something and it fires a trigger in your brain and you say, oh, I'm, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to take that right there now. And we stop listening. We can't wait for them to take a breath so that we can hit the missile button. There's nothing wrong with disagreeing. You're going to disagree. I mean, to think that we're all going to disagree, that we're all going to agree. I've, I've had people in the church here say, well, I'm going to go find me another church because I don't agree with some things. Well, good luck. <laughs> good luck. That would be like being married, and you get married, and you say, well, I, th I think we're going to get a divorce because we don't agree on some things. It's the craziest thing I've ever heard. My wife and I don't agree on a lot of things. But we've been married 31 years. And we talk about getting old together. It's okay. But when there's a disagreement and you're listening Make a mental list. You say, why is that? Because you want to understand what they're saying. So when they finish, you say, okay, let me make sure that I understand what you're saying. You're saying this and this and this and this. Is that what you're saying? And they say, no, that's not what I'm saying. Okay, well, I didn't understand you. Tell me again because I want to understand what you're saying. You see the whole approach there? Because what you're saying is, I, I care, I care that we have an issue. I care that we have a problem. And I really want to understand where you're coming from. I really want to understand what you're going, because we're one flesh. We, we want to live in harmony in our relationship. We want to live in harmony in our home. And so... I want to make sure that I understand. Proverbs 18, 13 cuts to the chase regarding the importance of listening. It says, he or she who answers a matter before he or she hears it is a folly and a shame to them. In other words, if you do that, you're not going to communicate. Conversation, inclu including heated conversation, it's a two-way street. You're having a meaningful conversation with your spouse because you're sharing your concerns. But if you're failing to listen to what their concerns are, then you're not really conversing with them. You're just lecturing them. Then number seven, don't throw gas on the situation. I'm going to show you how we do this. Don't throw gas on the situation. Uh, in marriage, I tell our leadership all the time, you got two buckets of two buckets. One of them we have what? Water. The other one we have what? How do you put water on it instead of gasoline? 
And a lot of times, little conflicts become big deals. In fact, if you'll go back and you will just remember your arguments, your fights, your disagreements, most of it doesn't amount to a whole lot. Most of it is over stuff that doesn't even matter. So how do we make it worse instead of making it better? Well, we throw gas on it when we use the word you too much. Whenever a conflict, and we say, you, 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 you. Example, you always waste money. You never spend time with me. Now, Gina will know this, and she's not here today to shoot me down like she did a few weeks ago. But here's the deal. Always and never. I don't deal with that because I don't always do anything. Okay? And so, whenever you, you always, you never, you're throwing gas on it. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. You say, well, what do I say then? Let, 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 me, let me help you with this. Instead of saying, you always waste money, how about saying something like this? You know, I've been thinking, and I feel like we really ought to work a little bit harder at trying to save some money. A little bit easier to swallow than you always waste money? You never spend time with me. Rather than leveling that kind of an accusation, well, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be, doesn't it sound a little bit better to say, you know what, I feel like we don't spend enough time together. I feel like we ought to have a date night. By the way, how many of you had a date this week? Let me see your hands. Oh, the rest of you need to be at the altar. <laughs> we had a triple date. I feel. You see, it changes the whole dynamic because revealing your feelings is the, is the beginning of of healing in a relationship. Uh, Paul says this in Galatians 2, 6, 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. It's not an optional thing. And if you've ever done weight training, you're always encouraged to train with another person so they can spot you. And, and they make sure that everything is okay. They help with the poundage. And especially with the last two or three reps, when you're really straining and doing your best to to go further than you've ever gone, the spotter is the best way to go because that person there is literally sharing the burden with you. They may have a hold of the weight bar and they may be kind of helping you push the last few ways. We need to be relational spotters with our spouses. You say something like, you know, looks like you had a bad day at work. I mean, can I help you bear that burden? You seem like you're a little bit down about something that your father said to you. I understand what that's like. Can I help you walk through this? It's about sharing and bearing the feelings of another. And let me tell you what that does. It removes the I factor and it reinforces the we factor. So what do we do when we have a conflict? Well, we have to take it to God. And let me challenge you that when you have a relational sticking point in your marriage, to talk to God first. But here's the deal. Be prepared for His perspective. Because 99% of the time, any time I've ever gone to God about conflict in our relationship over 31 years, God usually shows me that I'm part of the issue. You see, 
I pray for my spouse every day. And by taking the problem to God and praying for your spouse, you're engaging in the ministry of reconciliation. What is the goal of conflict? Differences. Reconciliation. Reconciliation. Ought to be the goal within the body of Christ. Ought to be the goal within every marriage. Uh, we ought to be reconciled to Christ. We ought to be reconciled to one another. How do you handle conflict? Well, I'm hoping today that, that through what I've shared with you, that maybe it kind of helps you as you navigate through the maze of life. Father, thank you today for your grace. God, you have lavished us with your grace. You have forgiven us. You have freed us. You've indwelled us. Father, you have empowered us to live a life of victory. And I pray today, Father, for the marriages that are represented in this room. And oh God, use us as a, as a reflection to the world as to what a Christian marriage is. God, remind us that we are one. We're one in marriage. We're one in Christ. Father, remind us that, that we're to come alongside, that we're to encourage we're to pray for one another. And so, Father, I pray today, Lord, if there's healing that needs to be done, that today, even right now, that, that healing would come about. I pray today that you will bless our families. Bless our church. How's your marriage? One is terrible. Ten is unbelievable. How's your marriage? Marriage is something we got to work at. In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing and altars open. Maybe you want to come as a couple and pray. Say, God bless our marriage. Use us to reflect Christ to others. Use us to reflect Christ to our children. Use us to reflect Christ to our friends. Maybe you've been visiting and you want to come and you want to be a part of our church. Bobby and John are here. Just come and say, we want to join this church. And we have some people that will talk to you about what it means to be a member of the church. And if you've never trusted Jesus, just like these teenagers that were baptized this morning made their decision for Christ public today, you can trust Jesus and your sin can be forgiven. We have folks that will talk with you. Just come and say, I, I want to know what it means to be a Christian. Father, help us today. As we're in process, as we're a part of the journey, God, to, to understand and know you are guiding, directing, using us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand, we're going to sing, and you come. On the cross was a gift freely given, righteousness for the weak, sent from heaven with your strength.